Well, I guess we are started, so I better <laughs> be doing something. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with prayer. Precious Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. You are an awesome God, and you care for your people so much. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us, for giving us your grace, and for uh, just walking with us each and every day of our lives. Open our hearts this morning, we pray, Lord, as we look at the Gospel of John, which your Holy Spirit has caused to be written for our learning. May we learn what you would have us learn. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're, we're in uh, John chapter 4, uh, verses 43 to 54. If you have the sheet from last week, that's kind of where we're, we're at. Uh, it's Jesus healing an official son. Um, and starting at uh, verse 43. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. All right, you've got this uh, healing of the official son. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a simple miracle. And, and, and that sounds kind of strange. Can you say that any miracle is simple? In our, our mind's eyes, no, they're, uh, they're complicated. For Jesus, yes, simple. Turn, turning the water into wine, no big deal for him. He puts, hasn't put water into the stone jars, it's now wine. Uh, uh, healing the official son, he just says, go, your son's well. I, I, that's just astounding, just astounding. He, he doesn't have to touch him, doesn't say... Uh, any magic words, just your your son is well. Okay. If you have the sheet, question one. The royal official came to Jesus because his son was near death and the situation looked hopeless. In desperation, the father begged Jesus to come to heal his son. Jesus' response in verse 48 seems heartless. Why might Jesus have said such a thing? Notice, in desperation, the Father begged Jesus. It's kind of kind of like what we do in desperation. We say, Lord, heal my child, heal my loved one, uh, work this, this miracle in, in my life, our lives. And that's what, where this official was. So Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That seems a little bit harsh. What do you think? Why might Jesus have said such a thing? Do you have extras of last week's? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because I'm like, where are we? Yeah, we're, I'm sorry. We're, we're on uh, last week's lesson that we didn't get finished because somebody okay. talked too much. Okay. <laughs> could he, could he, be, he wanted to see if the guy had the faith to just listen to him and go? 
Yeah, kind of a... Uh, hey, uh, you people, and you can understand, you people, you won't believe unless you see miracles and signs. You know, they always got to have some proof. Mm -hmm. Always got to have some proof. And, and that's kind of what he's saying here. He's not trying to be uh, harsh about it, but he's saying... Look, this is the way your human nature works. Unless you see a sign or a miracle, you're not, you're not going to believe. Okay, well, uh, what does verse 48 tell us about Jesus' love? Same, same verse. Uh, now what does it tell us about his love? First we think he's being harsh. Now we're saying, no, he's loving. How is he loving? Because he healed his son without even touching him. Yeah. Cer certainly, that, and that's the, the miraculous part. But unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. How is that a loving statement? Tell the truth. He's telling the truth. Here is the truth of, uh, and you need to understand this. You need to know this, Father. Yep, this is what you want. What you really need is faith. Faith. And Jesus doesn't say it there. But that's what they he, the Father needs. It's what we all need. So, question three, if you have the sheet. What does verse 50 tell us about the man's faith? Verse 50. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. What's his act of faith there? He went on his way. He went on his way. If he didn't he, have faith, he just kind of dragged Jesus with him. He, he, he figured he had to get Jesus to go with him, you know, kind of like a doctor, and, and do something over my child. And Jesus said, no, just go. Your, your son is well. Well, uh, yeah, he just goes. He went on his way. John says he believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, but the action or the proof of that belief was that he went on his way. Okay, you say he's healed, I'm out of here. I'll go check him out. Okay. Number four, what made it clear to the man that Jesus had performed a great miracle? As you read past verse 50, servants meeting, telling his son was recovering. What happens now? The time. The time. So, what time did this happen? Well, seventh hour, about one o'clock in the afternoon. And and uh, the father knew that was the hour. Hey, can you imagine the? The shivers that the father got. <laughs> wow, that's the time that Jesus said, "My son was healed." That's uh, that's a great miracle. And and again, what's so intriguing about this miracle is that Jesus wasn't even by the son. He just said, "Go, your son will live." Hmm, that's neat. What was the result of this miracle on the man's household? They all began to believe. <laughs> yeah, they... Uh, and he himself believed in all his household. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a miracle that, that is not just for that immediate family, the father, son, and, and uh, perhaps mother or, or siblings. This is the whole household now. They're, they're all believing. They know what happened, what took place. So they believe too. Wow. Good stuff. But did they believe because of the miracle? I mean, he said earlier that you guys all need miracles, you need signs, and they got the sign, but what if they didn't get the sign when they believed? I mean, we don't know, but... True, we don't know. It's, it's kind of... Um, 
Jesus speaking to Thomas. Uh, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so, yes, this miracle, and, and that's what the miracles were for, was to uh, demonstrate the power of God in the lives of the people. But it's to bring people to faith in, in Jesus as, as the Messiah. So, yeah, I, I kind of think his, uh, when the official asked what, you know, what time was it, he already believed because he walked away when Jesus pronounced the word. He believed. So I think he asked that question for our benefit, for his household's benefit. Because he already believed. He knew it was going to be so. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 50. The man believed the word. Yeah. yeah. So he wasn't surprised by it. I think he asked that kind of as confirmation to everybody else. See? Yeah, well, good point. Yeah. So what time has happened? Oh, about 1 o'clock. Okay. That's the time Jesus said. So, okay, all you uh, servants, all you people in the household, th this is the scenario. He did it. Yeah, good point. All right, the memory verse that you all took home last week. All, all how many? Five of us over here. <laughs> Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Each week I assign a memory verse. Uh, kind of, mind you, confirmation class. I just want to bring you back to that. <laughs> That wonderful time in your life when, when you enjoyed uh, memory work or something like that. But I want us to, to uh, kind of put some time into the scriptures and, and it's, it's not that difficult to, to memorize. If, if you were one of these in confirmation class and you, you had a difficult time with memory, um, I, I can understand and appreciate that. And, and there's no quiz, so you don't. I don't call upon somebody. You know, you know. I, you know, I could say no. I wouldn't say Donna because I have to live with her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say Jan, recite for us. I won't do that to you <laughs> because that's not a very fun thing to do. All right. Thoughts, comments, questions on this healing. All right. We're going to go to chapter five now. You have the worksheet. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. <laughs> After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Look at that ver uh, those words, verse 9, at once. You'll notice in all of Jesus' miracles, there, it's immediate. It's at once. It's, you know, it's, it's right now. So that, that's interesting. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. 
But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. All right, this is uh, another one. If you saw uh, the chosen, uh, uh, we, we had this, this exact thing. And they showed how this man couldn't get to the pool. What was so special about the Bethesda pool? Why did all these people hang out there? They believed that when the water was stirred up, that they could get in and that would get them healing. But they had to be in where the water was stirring at the time it was stirring or yeah. it wouldn't heal them. And they had to be, had to be first. And, and, you know, who, who said there is healing? It's, it's what they believed. That an angel would come and stir the waters and you had to jump in there real quick. And this poor guy was lame. He couldn't get in. He was always 38 years. This poor guy couldn't, couldn't make it. And so here's the, here's the predicament he's in. How do we see Jesus' compassion and heart at work in this story? First, verse, uh, question one. How do you see Jesus' compassionate heart for this individual? His immediate healing of him. It's an immediate healing. He doesn't make him uh, jump through hoops or jump in the water or whatever the case may be. Jesus just has compassion and he heals him. Yeah. Wow. Some people say, uh, question two, that Jesus answers our prayers and performs miracles if only we have faith. Evaluate this thought. Jesus answers prayers and performs miracles if only we have faith. What do you I, think? I don't think, we don't know if this guy had faith or not. True. So, I mean, I think Jesus, I mean, obviously Jesus can answer miracles and do miracles if you have faith or not, if he chooses to do so. I don't know if we know that. <laughs> it doesn't appear as though faith is a requirement yeah. in order for Jesus to do it. Not a requirement, no. Well, look at the gospel from today, the ten lepers. Mm -hmm. One of those guys was a Samaritan. I mean, that's, that's kind of like scum of the earth. Uh, you know, Samaritans weren't well thought of by the Jews. But he's the one guy that comes back to say thanks. Uh, yeah, we don't know about their faith either. You know, so we don't want to... Uh, in fact, in my first congregation many moons ago, I had a, a young lady whose brother-in-law got cancer. And she had kind of wandered away from our church and was going to a I don't know, Pentecostal church uh, uh, of some sort down in another community. And she came to me and, and said, uh, Pastor, uh, my brother-in-law has cancer and the pastor there told me it's my fault because I don't have enough faith. And I, and I'm just going, I am two months out of the seminary. <laughs> they never talked about this. <laughs> And uh, so that, you know, she and because of that, and, and listening to other stuff that the guy was saying, she began to believe that she was possessed. And I said to her, "Do you believe that Jesus is your Savior?" She said, "Oh yeah, yeah." I said, "Well, you're not possessed." I said, "The Holy Spirit possesses you, and Satan cannot." Uh, possess you at the same time. Oh. Well, this, you know, brilliant young pastor who had all this great theological training. <laughs> and, but what she needed was to hear from somebody with reverend in front of his name that she was not possessed. And that it wasn't her fault that her brother-in-law had cancer. I, it, 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 it just stunned me. If I would have been older and, and not such a coward, I would have gone down to talk to that pastor and see if 
if that's what he said or if that's what, you know, maybe that's what she heard. I don't know. But, yeah. Jesus does these things in our lives whether our faith is strong or not. And, and we see miracles all the time, what you and I would consider to be miracles, in the lives of people who, who have no faith or, or very little or, or you know, they're or confused in their faith or whatever the case may be. Jesus' miracles don't depend on us. They depend on Him. Uh, I, I've told you before, I have a brother-in-law who is an agnostic. He's been an agnostic for uh, 50 plus years and we have worked on him and, and uh, talked to him and uh, prayed for him and, uh, and tried to uh, in fact, our son was a, worked for the Billy Graham Association. They had a, a crusade down in Dallas where brother, brother in law lives. And John got tickets to go and he's going to take Uncle Jerry to the crusade. No, nope, he, he, he didn't want to. They went out to dinner instead. <laughs> None of so, so my brother in law, Jerry, has, has no use for God. You know, he wants some proof, proof that there is a God. And, uh, the, you know, we gave him proof after proof after proof, or at least what we thought. And nothing, nothing worked. Well, he has since um, gotten older. Uh, uh, he's had a stroke. He's in assisted living. And he needed a wheelchair. And the uh, local Catholic church loaned him a, a wheelchair. And, of course, being the gracious person I am, I said to him on the phone once, I said, see, even the Catholics are coming for you. Which, <laughs> 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 he was raised Lutheran, by the way. Uh, not, not the right Lutheran, but he was raised Lutheran. <laughs> so, so sometimes we, we think, well, it's, this miracle or that is based on me. And, and what I believe and how strong my faith is. Uh, we have miracles in our lives that, that we perhaps do not see or do not understand. But nonetheless, Jesus is the one at work. God's doing, doing his thing in our lives, whether we see it or not. So, thoughts on that? Comments? All we can do is plant seeds. Yeah, doggone, this seed's not growing very well either. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. That our calling is to plant the seed. It's to share the good news. It's, and, and, uh, and pray. Yeah, and, and keep, pray. keep praying for it. You know, I, I do not, in terms of my brother-in-law, I don't want him dying without faith. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I you know, there were times when his father died and, and, and we were down for, not for the funeral, but we were down later. And I asked him, I said, what do you think dad is? Well, my dad believed in an afterlife, so he believed he was going to heaven. Uh, but for me, he's six feet under. That's it. And, and I just... So he doesn't acknowledge hell? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, and, and he certainly doesn't. He wants proof that there's a God. So, if you come up with proof that he'll accept, I mean, that's always the case. He just, interesting enough, my sister, um, Missouri Center Lutheran, her four boys raised and confirmed Missouri Center Church, and he never stood in the way of, of that. Uh, Whenever I was preaching in the hometown or at my ordination, he came for those occasions. And I, you know, that was out of love and respect uh, for our family. And, and you go, okay, well, another opportunity for him to hear the gospel. Uh, it, but it's frustrating. Because when I planned, I wanted to grow. <laughs> so, but, that's right. We'll let the Holy Spirit do his thing. Okay, question three.
The Jewish leaders had added their own laws to the laws God gave Moses. The Jews accused the man of breaking God's law by carrying his mat on the Sabbath. They focused on their own rules and regulations so much that they missed the significance of the miracle. How do we sometimes focus on church traditions and miss more important issues? Aha! Uh -huh. So the Jewish leaders, they were upset with the guy because he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that. You can't, you know, they made exceptions for certain things, but they were all over this guy because he was doing work on the Sabbath. In their, in their definition of work, he was carrying this mat that he had carried around for all these years. Uh, do we ever do stuff like that in the church where we value tradition over the Word of God? And then you have to give an example. <laughs> we here, we've always done it that way. We've always done it that way. Famous last words of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Isn't the Catholic Church based on tradition? Uh, and, and I'm getting out of Denying the scripture? <laughs> as far as the Pope and his power? And, yeah. I mean, yeah. the whole church is tradition. Well, tradition is, is a, a, a major part. I was, I was involved with Promise Keepers a number of years ago, and one of the guys who was on our leadership team was a, a solid uh, solid Christian and, mm -hmm. and was Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Promise Keepers came out with a statement at the time that said that um, that we are saved by grace through faith alone. They added the word alone. And uh, Steve was his name. Good guy. He says, I, I'm, uh, I'm okay with everything that you know, Promise Keepers does and you know, their statement of faith except that word alone. Mm -hmm. And I said, Oh, I don't know. I thought that was a pretty good word to put in there. And we had a discussion. He says that the Roman Catholic Church believes in um, faith and tradition and the uh, magisterium, uh, which I didn't quite get. But tradition is certainly a very big part. And the magisterium, it is kind of, as I understood it, it's what the Pope says, mm -hmm. what the, the College of Cardinals, how, how they come down on all this kind of stuff. And I'm just, I, I'm you know, not, not being raised Catholic or understanding uh, Roman Catholicism very well. I just was uh, perplexed that we would put, or they would put anything above Scripture. And of course, Martin Luther had his issues with that, which is kind of why we're where we are today. So, so yeah. Uh, uh, but how about in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Center? Do we have traditions... Uh, uh, that we uh, we'll take redemption. I can give you traditions from other churches I've served, but <laughs> uh, any tradition, any traditions here that kind of get in the way? Not that they're bad traditions. Let me, let me back up. Customs uh, that maybe get in the way of worship or serving the Lord. I don't think you, this one happens now. I'm well, I know it doesn't. But I can remember growing up here when communion was only offered on this Sunday and this Sunday. Yeah. So that's a tradition that's changed yeah. for the better. Yeah. Uh, I can remember when we changed it at St. Paul's. I had someone say, now we're becoming like the Catholics. And I, <laughs> I'm going, <laughs> well, I said, well, the Catholics have a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine too. Did, he didn't make a big stink about it. He just voiced a, a concern about that. And I go, yeah, that, that's not where we're going. You know? uh, we served a church a number of years ago where, um, unbeknownst to me, we arrived at the congregation in December, and after Christmas, uh, a couple came to me wanting to get married in March. Fifth, I think, was their wedding day. And I said, "Okay, and you know, let's sit down and do premarital counseling." Together. And they were happy to do that. When I announced this to the elders that I had this wedding, I said, "Well, we don't do weddings during Lent." I go, 
I said, you don't? <laughs> I said, it would have been nice to have told the new pastor that you're not supposed to do this. Um, and we did the wedding. And they needed to get married. And we, we made sure of that. And and, um, and and the congregation didn't throw us think about it. You know, they no, no flowers during Lent. Did you ever have that here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that here. Yeah. Still? I think it's on the board out there. Oh. I'm pretty sure it is. Mm -hmm. Why? Good question. Okay. <laughs> and, and that's fine. I mean, and at one point there may have been a good, uh, value, right. valid reason for it that we've lost over the years. Mm -hmm. Now, some will say, uh, okay, uh, because Lent is a penitential season and we shouldn't be celebrating with, with live flowers or colorful flowers. Okay. Um, no flowers on the altar. Um, and what was the situation? No artificial. Oh, was no, no artificial flowers on the altar. Okay, I, I agreed with that one. So that was okay. Um, but, oh, that only cut flowers could be on the altar. Because cut flowers were a sacrifice. They can't be a plant. It can't be a plant. And I said, cost of plants, that's a sacrifice. And I allow, I allow plants to be on the altar. Okay. Right, wrong, or otherwise? No. It, it, it's tradition. And if people understand the tradition, and everybody's agree, well, then it's not a big deal. Then, okay, no, no problem. Another yeah. tradition that changed, that the choir always sang at the 11 o'clock service. Forever and ever and ever that I can remember, and okay. now we are changed to three o'clock on Christmas Eve. Oh, Christmas Eve. Okay, oh, yeah. let's go. We don't have a three. <laughs> <laughs> we changed holiday value. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on Christmas Eve, you now sing at three o'clock. Yeah, that's what they say. And the eleven was the midnight service. Mm -hmm. Pardon. Yeah. Oh, midnight okay. service. Okay, yeah. that's the. Yeah. And why was that changed? Because the choir was tired at 11 o'clock? <laughs> we didn't change it. Somebody else did. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tradition for the sake of tradition doesn't make any sense. Maybe because we're getting older, we become <clears throat> at 3 instead of 11. <laughs> well, <laughs> well let me tell you, last, last year, last Christmas, when I did the 3 and the 11, I had to drag myself to yes, the 11. Yes, you did. I was so tired. And you were so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, and, and I, actually, for me, it, it was fun because I got to preach another Christmas. Because mm -hmm. you know, retired guys don't do that. And plus so, Sarah brought you. And, and, uh, plus, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, our daughter brought brought me. <clears throat> brought me. <laughs> That's <laughs> your daughter. That's <laughs> what daughters are for. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Back to your point, though, Michael. Yeah. Tradition for the sake of tradition is pointless. If, yeah, if, so if it doesn't help the faith, it doesn't. It doesn't help to bring others to, to Jesus. There's there's no point in in that. Now it's okay to have traditions sure. that we can explain. Like we do communion this way, and this is why, and we can we can all say that. Uh, but if it is not, if it okay. doesn't move the faith forward, <coughs> from the person, then. Why are we doing that? What's yeah. that purpose? Yeah. Uh, so there, there are certain traditions that we may question and, and uh, or we'll wonder why we don't do them or why we do do them. Tradition, what I've loved about redemption up until COVID was the common cup and communion. Now we don't do common cup anymore. Would you like it to return? Yes. It's been discussed. Then, yes, that my opinion. Then I have two votes for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, and I, I know people have. Uh, I, I'm under the impression that at St. Paul's we never had common cup. Uh, first Monday, Thursday, I was there. I said we're going to have common cup only. Not a smart Ooh. move. The only communion <laughs> attendance went down like this, and I said ah. Learned will will have common cup also on oh. on them, um, but that which is what I've appreciated about redemption is that we we'd have both both ways okay. But anyway, that's my two cents for 
those who have that kind of authority to make those decisions. So. <laughs> but uh, does it matter in the in the long uh, in the scheme of things? No. No. It matters that we have communion, and that was uh, that was the important thing. And and Jim, I have to. Uh, I, I remember back when I was here that um, you and Pat came in for communion and kind of forced my hand uh, in, a, in a good sense that way. Because I was wondering what we were going to do with communion. We hadn't had communion in a month or something when COVID first started. And, and you guys, maybe it was Pat. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're gonna, we need communion. And, and so we came and went into the chapel and yeah. had communion. And, very grateful to them. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. and it kind of jogged my, well, hey, we got to, yeah. you know, and we were coming into spring and then yeah. we could do the parking lot thing. But uh, but these traditions that we do are, are can be good, but we can't just hang on to traditions. And that's what the that's what the Jews were doing here, as they were hanging on to tradition and chewing on this poor guy who had been, an invalid for 38 months, uh, 38 years. months, 38 years, yeah. and and uh, goodness gracious, he had uh, he had this blessing of, of being uh, now being able to walk. What a what a fantastic thing for him. Okay, uh, moving on to verse 16 that I already read. 16 to 30. This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. And greater works than these will He show Him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Wow. Ah, some heavy stuff in the midst of all this. Um, if you look at question one there, under that section, when the Jewish leaders attacked Jesus for working on the Sabbath day, he responded that he was only doing what his father was doing. Humanly speaking, this statement signed Jesus' death warrant. Why? Because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be God. It's the very worst thing he could ever do, is claim to be God. Uh, because there's only one God. And that's the, the great Old Testament sh Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And, and now Jesus is claiming to be God. That's blasphemy. we got we got to do something with this guy. And, and killing him is what they had in mind. So, okay. 
Number two, many mo modern theologians say that Jesus never claimed he was the Son of God. How does this account make it clear that Jesus did claim to be the Son of God? Jehovah's Witnesses make this claim. Jesus is uh, a Son of God, just as we males are sons of God, but he is not God. That's their big claim. And so they don't believe in the Trinity. And it's Jesus being the second person of the Trinity. So, how does this account of Jesus make it clear that he is God? Well, it's comparing what God could do and what he could do with the same thing. Raising people from the dead and healing people. And yeah. That the Son won't do anything that the Father won't do. Or the Son can only do things the Father does. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the doing the doing the things that only God can do, kind of thing. And verse 18, uh, you know, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, oh my goodness, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So if the Jews, the leadership there, thought he was calling him, uh, was claiming to be God, uh, that's that's the big deal. He is God, and and therein is the problem. You cannot claim to be God um, because you're not God. Well, there's all kinds of uh, incidences where Jesus, uh, you know, says the Father and I are one. You know, well, you, you can't make that claim unless it's real. But they, but they argue. I was talking to a gentleman who argued that, and he said he believes everything in red print, and it's in red. Jesus said it, but he was trying to say it's out of out of context, not from the other stuff. They try to even argue that. Yeah, I, well, once you've been uh, convinced or brainwashed, whatever you want to call it, to believe in one thing, you're not going to accept uh, what the Scripture has to say. And the Scripture is, is our, our basis. It's not tradition. Uh, there, there are some, sometimes in, in the Lutheran Church, you get a little uh, concerned that Martin Luther starts raising higher and higher. Luther was a brilliant man. I am convinced he was a genius. Uh, the stuff he wrote and uh, all that he could do, it's, and the fact that he he uh, managed to stay alive because they had a, a death uh, warrant out on him too. Uh, but he is not God, and he is not equal to the scriptures. And that's where we, we get into conflict with some of our other <coughs> brothers and sisters who think you know, that other holy writings are equal to Scripture. They are not. So. Alright. Uh, verse 31. We're going to wrap up this. Verse 31. Uh, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the tes testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works the that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. 
You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? That, that's a, a little... Uh, discouraging, I would think, on Jesus' part. If you're not going to believe Moses, and he wrote about me, how will you ever believe me? I, 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 I never thought about this before, but it, it seems a little bit um, Jesus feeling a little frustrated or disappointed or down or, or whatever there. Um, you got Moses, you got the prophets, you don't believe them because they write about me. And so how will you ever believe me? You know, how are you ever going to believe him? When God sends his very own son, here he is in the flesh and you don't believe him. Uh, I could do it. Yeah, well, anyway. Question one. How is Jesus different from the self-righteous leaders who praise themselves? He didn't boast about himself. Yeah, he wasn't boasting. And who who was giving him the the uh, the authority, the praise, the uh, the kudos? Yeah, it's God the Father. He's the one who bears witness uh, uh, to Jesus. And he says, uh, and also John, you sent uh, you sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. But they're not going to believe John either. Okay. Number two, Jesus considers the testimony of his father as alone being valid, yet he points to a human witness. To whom does Jesus point? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, yeah. Why? Because they believed John. Because they would accept John. Well, at least some of them would. Um, they accepted him until, well, Herod didn't really like him so much. Uh, Kind of. yeah, Herod didn't like him because John called him out on his sin. Do you ever notice how we don't like to be called out on our sin? Don't, you know, I, I always made it a point to make sure that if I was preaching on a particular sin that I knew of in the congregation, I would never look in that person's direction. <laughs> you probably don't have to. They probably think you are anyway. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but I didn't want them thinking, oh, he's he's nailing me he's and he knows me. and uh, yeah. he's picking on me. No. Uh, and, and don't we know? There's enough sin to go around. And you can pull out any sin and people, uh, we're all guilty. Is that why you never look at me? Uh, <laughs> I know too much about you, Michael. Uh, uh, so I would say he pointed, pointed to Moses. I'm sorry? I would say he pointed to Moses because the Jews are under the law and Moses, yeah. Moses was the law and Moses, yeah. Moses was almost their God. And he reflects on Moses and Moses said, he, Moses pointed towards Jesus and they don't they don't believe even Moses now. Yeah, so, so we want to believe what we want to believe and don't, mm -hmm. don't mess with us mm -hmm. here. Uh, and, and now we're talking the leadership here. We're Correct. not necessarily talking about the average uh, Jewish person, but you're right. Uh, you, you got Moses, whom they held in high esteem. Mm -hmm. uh, who, Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which was still very important to the Jews. Uh, 
but Moses points to me and you don't believe Moses. John comes, he points to me and you don't believe John. Now here I am and you don't believe me. Well, who are you going to believe? And so, there we go. So in the church, who do we believe? We believe the scriptures because they point us to Jesus. And that's why we're always cautious uh, in, in our uh, particular denomination that while we uh, may regard the pastor in high esteem uh, for his position, we don't hold him up as, um, as a pope or as you know, uh, infallible or perfect or whatever. Uh, uh, we had our home pastor who confirmed Donna and me and, and married us. Um, I always said, uh, if, if Jesus sat at the right hand of God, Pastor Gardell sat at the left hand of God. Mm -hmm. that, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's where I held him, which was idolatrous. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, uh, he was the kind of pastor I always wanted to be. Because in my mind, you know, I, he came to our congregation, I think, when I was 12 or 13. So I'm is in these uh, uh, formative years. Uh, one of his first funerals, I think, was my dad, and and so I I, I grew to appreciate uh, Pastor more and more. So, uh, but he wasn't perfect, and he would acknowledge that. The Jews, uh, you know, held up Moses, and some of them would hold up John. But uh, the prophets, but you know, even the prophets, they stoned the prophets, they killed the prophets. You know, who, they couldn't win. Because the leadership wouldn't, wouldn't allow for that. What did the Jews really believe? Just God the Father and the Holy Spirit? Or, or did they not even really believe that? The, they, they believed uh, in God and and. Father, Creator, yes. Um, they should have seen that there was a second person of the Trinity from the Old Testament. Uh, obviously, these guys didn't. Uh, the Spirit of God was certainly true. There, there was a tri there is a Trinity in the Old Testament, but the Jews refused to see that. Mm -hmm. So, again, that that great statement of faith: uh, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." And that's all they could handle. So Jesus comes along claiming to be God. No, you're not, because we have God. And you don't fit in. So uh, the, the, uh, one of the things I read some years ago, uh, Muhammad uh, likes, liked the monotheistic religions of Judaism and Christianity because of one God. And that's why he cannot, he could not handle the trinity of Christianity because he thought it was three gods. Well, mm -hmm. no, it's one God revealed in three persons. But, uh, but that's usually the complaint of Christianity is that you got all these gods. But Muhammad appreciated the monotheism of, of one God as opposed to Hindus or Buddhists who have all these. Hindus have 300, the last time I count, they had 330 million gods. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, you know, you go and, and uh, each each little, in India anyway, each little community had, had their own gods and goddesses. And, and they call it, and they, they had the, I think they have a big three in there, I can't remember their names. Um, and that was one thing, but in each little community, uh, which, when I was in India, we were walking New Delhi, and this guy pulled up alongside, and there was this little shrine alongside, and there was a little flame inside, and he'd come up and take money and offer it in the, in the shrine. You know, it would burn up, but it was an offering. And I really wanted to go over there after he pulled away and pull that out before. 
for a bird up. That, that wasn't possible. Um, Acceptable. <laughs> yeah, well, the, he probably wouldn't have been happy with me. Yeah, uh, but you know, when you, when you look at that kind of um, uh, worship of a deity that that you cannot see and, uh, and and cannot understand, and there's no there's no no proof as we have in the scriptures. You know, you, you look at the Quran uh, in, in uh, Islam; it's it's continuing to be written. I'm told that it's not a complete work. It's just they add to it, take away. You know, you know, they, they, I don't know. Is that Ken? Does that answer your mm -hmm. question here? So why couldn't the Jewish leaders see Jesus for who he was? Take away their authority. Take away their authority. He, he uh, not only was he blasphemous, but he, he was messing with the, the, the monetary system of, of the sacrifices and things. Why was Jesus upset with the money changers in the temple? It, it was because they were doing stuff that was um, heretical. You know you. You're taking away this time of worship from the Gentiles just so you can do your trading in the temple courtyard area. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's like, you know, uh, it, it would be in the, in the back of the sanctuary. Oh my gosh, you know, we'd all go nuts over that. Uh, but having said that, be sure to come to the bazaar on November 5th. <laughs> <laughs> Gymnasium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, Jesus was messing with their system. Well, the memory verse, John five twenty four. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. That's a great verse. Uh, you may think it's too long to memorize, but it is. Whoever hears my word and believes has eternal life. It's not a future thing. It's a present thing. We have eternal life right now. You know, we always think, well, I'll have eternal life when I get to heaven. Well, yes, but you have it right now because you believe. And that's where I think God gives uh, opportunities for people. He doesn't take them home. My brother-in-law is still alive. He's 70, uh, what is he? 78. So he's hopefully got more time. And, and maybe, just maybe, the Roman Catholics are getting through to him down there. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's on somebody. Well, we'll penetrate that heart. I don't know if you have those kinds of folks in your family. Um, we all have know, know them and, and want, only want them to have eternal life. I don't care if they become Lutheran. That's, that's the best way, of course. But I want them to know Jesus. However that happens. But the hope that we have is that you bring up a child in a way. Yes. When he is old, he will not depart. And he's old. Yep. And I was waiting for that. What's that? I was waiting for that. And he's old. And he's old. Well, and that's the promise we have from the God. Yeah. That he's going to come and be with the years and say, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 I mean, you raised them in the, in the church, raised them in the faith, you know, modeled the faith, you know. And the Bible says, train up a child the way you should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I take that as a promise. I don't fully understand it, but I take it as a promise. Well, I see that in my son. You know, I mean, he was brought up in, in, in the church and in the Christian school and everything, and when he went to college, he kind of fell away from it all yeah. and stuff. 
but he has made a full circle return. It has a oh. wonderful. Yeah, great. I'm very happy. It holds to that promise. When he is old, he will not return. You know, it never defines how old old is. So <laughs> when, he, when he's well, that's old too. Yeah. When he is older, yeah, it is relative. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Thoughts, comments, questions. Why have I never heard a sermon on John chapter five, verses thirty through forty, whatever? It's just it's just an area that. I, I'm not familiar with this passage of scripture. It's just not something I've really ever heard of. Why haven't you heard a? I think you should talk to Pastor Josh. <laughs> he hasn't been here long enough to get through all of it yet. Me either. Uh, <laughs> chapter five, what? This is the section we just went over. Oh, this is starting with the witnesses to Jesus. Like it's just not a very familiar passage yeah. to me. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I can't say that I've ever preached on this section. Uh, maybe pulled out some verses out of it, but not dwelling on that particular thing. But we do uh, certainly talk about the fact that, particularly around Christmas and, and during Lent, uh, Old Testament pointing to Christ. You know, so right. that witness there. But yeah, you're right. There's. I just don't remember him. I don't remember him saying. Yeah, yeah, and calling them out so directly. It's just a and in such a John more often. such a lengthy way. I mean, that's several verses uh, where he's uh, speaking to them. You know, from uh, what verse nineteen to the end to 40, 47, uh, He's he's into that. That understanding that mode and talking to them about that. Um, and then what's interesting, and then he ends, John ends his gospel there, the end of chapter 5, and in chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. What, what happened here? <laughs> we, don't, we don't get to see, you know, what was the reaction of, well, we can imagine what the reaction of the Pharisees would have been. Uh, to, to John's or to Jesus' uh, comments, but then John moves on to the feeding of the five thousand, which uh, is a familiar miracle, uh, and, and we'll get to that next week. It is uh, an intriguing one to be sure. So, so a good question. I don't, I don't know. There's just a, uh, it's why why don't Lutheran pastors preach very much on Revelation? It's tradition. Uh, it's it's uh, safety. <laughs> it's so a number of years ago, we had a Lenten series. Came out of the district, I think, or sent it someplace. Uh, and it was uh, uh, the six-week sermon series on Revelation. The first three chapters. The letter to the seven churches. That's as far as we ever, ever got. Yeah. Well, then you, you you charge into the rest of Revelation. You go, oh, now I know why they they wanted to stop with the seven churches. And there was enough application, those seven churches. But we've never enjoyed uh, getting into all of the um, apocryphal stuff and all of the symbolism and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. So I think it's Revelation is hard to comprehend. Well. It is if we try to understand everything literally, yeah. Uh, but the, here's, the, here's the deal. Uh, this is the picture. We, the church, we win. Move on. God is giving us this, this glimpse. We win. Not to worry about it. All right. Prayer requests. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> my friend Marsha, she just had AFib. She was back in the hospital again for about uh, the umpteen time. And he's, she's had back surgery about three times. So oh. keep her in our prayers. Yeah. Okay. Keep up, Marsha. What? People, people of Florida. 
table of four. Yeah. See? My brother Mike. He just has some stuff going on that's not good. Just some stuff. Okay. Well, medical stuff. Yeah. Okay. Marsh is having cataract surgery on Wednesday. Different Marsh. Different Marsh. Marsh, Marsh, Marsh. We're connecting Marsha with Colleen. They know oh. each other. So. We are talking the same Marsha. Yeah, we're talking the same Marsha. Okay. <laughs> Michael's the one that That's got right. me in trouble with. <laughs> Gave her my phone number. <laughs> with permission. <laughs> yeah, right. We can add Jerry. Yeah, we'll add our brother in law, Jerry. And other knuckleheads who don't believe. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. As Jesus speaks to us in this gospel, and as uh, we maybe scratch our heads about uh, exactly what does he say or what does he mean, yet we know that he means for us to have eternal life. And we have that eternal life right now in him. Thank you for that great gift. We pray this day for those who are in need. Uh, for for Marcia, as uh, she struggles with a, a variety of health issues, and, and we pray that, uh, that you would uh, uh, watch over and be her great physician and heal her. For the people of Florida, as they continue to struggle uh, with the effects of Hurricane Ian, uh, oh, oh Lord, um, what a... What a a mess that is down there for them and we pray that uh, somehow they will uh, come through this and that uh, there will be help uh, given to those who need it and that uh, those who think about looting would think twice about doing that we pray for Keith's brother Mike uh, and for his health issues and ask for your your healing your comfort in his life for Marcia uh, Cordy as uh, she goes through life uh, today, and if she has cataract surgery, that that will be successful. And that as she uh, is able to renew friendship with Colleen, that uh, that would be a, a wonderful time of uh, celebrating uh, two sisters in Christ. And we pray for Jerry and for others who do not believe that you would uh, open their hearts and minds to hear the gospel, to accept the gospel, to live that gospel. So, Lord, we come to you this day bringing our, our thoughts, our prayers, our petitions in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a good day in the Lord.